Let's segue to, to Kanzuk right now. And before we jump into questions, I'd just like to acknowledge that James Skinner is in our audience. Uh, he is the founder of Kanzuk International and used to be the VP of our EDA. So uh, welcome, James. We're, uh, we're delighted to have you here. Um, so you did, a, you did a brief introduction to Kanzuk. Can you sort of tell us why you think it's a good idea? Um, and, you know, what's the time frame for making it happen, would you say? Well, time frames are perhaps a little difficult in something like this. Um, first of all, I would say, and hi, James, I can't see you, but we're meeting in Toronto uh, next month, so that's good. Um, we have historical ties. We have current ties already, very strong people-to-people -people ties. We are part of the Commonwealth, but the Commonwealth is a much, much bigger organization. We do share the same head of state. And we have a British parliamentary and legal tradition. I happen to be a lawyer. That's what I was trained in, was British slash Canadian law, um, as we interpret it here in Canada. And we come from a place where we are all multicultural, multilingual nations that believe in the rule of law and are free. You know, you can get a map of the free countries in the world, and it only covers about 40% of the countries in the world. N not everyone enjoys what we enjoy. Also, the uh, those three countries are with us are four out of our five uh, Five Eyes partners. So we already share a lot in terms of defense, intelligence, uh, defense activities, we have that already, that, that strength there. There's a lot of side deals right now, some between uh, Australia and New Zealand uh, in terms of travel, some between us and the others. Uh, no one's gone to Whistler and not met a new Kiwi or Aussie friend up there. So you do have uh, some mobility already for people under a certain age, under 30 for a couple of years. We'd like to see that expanded where it could be longer, maybe the age raised. We'd like to see uh, better recognition of foreign credentials. By foreign credentials, I don't just mean university degrees, although that may be one of them. I'm pretty sure if you have a degree from the University of Auckland, a friend of mine got his medical degree there who lives here, It's uh, nobody says he's a lesser doctor than uh, someone who got their medical degree at UBC. So, but it doesn't just have to be professionals. I think if you're in red seal trades, for instance, and you, you're an accredited electrician like my dad was, uh, I think that you should be able to go and, and practice your career there. I think those opportunities would really be fabulous to be able to go and work somewhere else um, and be able to work at something you're trained for would be amazing. With respect to the world, and we've mentioned China already, there's a lot going on in the Indo-Pacific these days, and I guess for some time, and it does not at all hurt what I would call mid-powers, middle powers like Australia, New Zealand, and Canada, UK is in a bit of a different category with a greater history and, and more people, but it would not hurt at all and would be a benefit if we could align some of our foreign policy more. You just have strength in numbers and we're well respected overall um, on the world stage, we would be even more so if we had some more formal alliances. And that might even reflect, I know James likes the idea of maybe a shared security council seat. I'm not sure the UK would give theirs up or share it with us, but I get the idea. The point is we could be um, greater together than we are right now, more separated. We think that we can be champions of trade, pool procurement, defense policy, and uh, greater mobility of people within these four countries. I've already been asked by several people, well, why not more countries? My answer is, let's get this job done first. You know, we've got four that we think have the most alignment. If we can actually move that to the policy stage and start having legislatures adopt it, 
that would be fantastic. That's where we are now, developing our ideas for policy that can be discussed by all four nations. Thank you. Um, so we, we know it's, you know, Kansas, Canada, uh, New Zealand, Australia, the UK, where, where is it furthest along and which country is the most reluctant, would you say? That's a bit of a hard question because James is here in Canada with Kansas International, which is a strong voice for Kansas and very active on social media and just in terms of uh, developing thought uh, and research around policy, he does a great job. In the UK, they do have an interparliamentary friendship group, as I mentioned, so it isn't just a conservative idea. They also have that in, um, in Australia, but again, it's mostly a conservative concept. And in New Zealand, they're, they're getting that going. Here in Canada, we haven't reached out beyond the Conserve Caucus because so far the Liberals have shown no interest. So what we thought was we should develop it a little more, mature it a little more. But I will tell you that if we form government, or I should say when we form government, that we envision having someone at least at a minister of state level who would be responsible for delivering on Kansas, probably create a secretariat and then uh, because there's so many aspects to this that you don't want it to be on the end of the trade minister's desk and the end of the you know employment minister's desk you want someone and a group focused just like any big job you need focus and you need someone a general contractor if you will who keeps it going and keeps the bus driving forward we plan to do that as conservatives so I would say overall there it's a mix but people are very interested I have a e-newsletter that I put out to about 4,000 people or so each month and I always put a little question in there, you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? So last month I did it on Kansas. We got the highest response we've ever had. And this is to people, yes, they're conservatives, but not all are conservatives. Some are just people around. Um, and it was something like, it was over 90% favorable to moving forward. It was actually amazing. And we put out a joint statement from myself and the heads of the movement, to call it that, in Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. And I think just that statement of a general um, high level ambition, what we want to try and do. Last I looked, I think it had, I don't know, closing in on 20,000 views or something. So. It's a topic that's been talked about for a long time, but we want to take it from talk into action. So, Carrie Lynn, I'm, I'm a Canadian Australian. Uh, mo half of my family lives in Australia. Do you think that it's going to be difficult selling uh, Kanzuk to the Australian public where per capita GDP is nearly 60 grand US versus in the UK where it's barely 40 grand uh, per capita US a year? Do you, do you think that is, is a, a stumbling block or do you think that'll be easy to get over? I don't personally think it is because at the end of the day, it really depends where you live in a country, what you do for a living, your level of education. I mean, there's areas in all our countries where people are more and less affluent, more and less educated. I think the great thing about the labor mobility, if we're not restricting it to just university degrees, which I think would be a wasted opportunity, if we're looking to people who are, you know, tradespeople and people who have other types of skills that are transferable, then I don't think that should be a barrier. I, I really don't. We, those of us in elected office, we we represent everyone in our writings. It's the same in all the, these are all representative democracies. So it's the same everywhere. They would have, you know, I have people in my writing who are very affluent and I have people who are homeless and out of work. So I think most of us have a mix and what we want to do is, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. We want to 
create something that gives opportunity to all.